The aim of the Whittle Laboratory is to decarbonise flight. And the problem is that the climate impact of aviation is set to double between now and 2050. And even though all of the world's aerospace researchers are actually working to reduce the emissions per passenger kilometre of flight per year, it's still rising because in 2018, only 11% of the world had flown. And as you have the rising middle class in Asia, Africa and South America starting to fly, this is going to drive up emissions. And so there's no alternative other than for us to as rapidly as possible decarbonise aerospace, and that is the objective of the lab. So the first way is to produce fuels, switch in fuels that will actually replace kerosene on the flight, but of net zero carbon in their production. And that would be one way of decarbonising flight. If you wanted to produce the fuels using renewable electricity, produce the fuels and switch them in, this would increase world electricity requirements by 40%, rising to 80% in 2050. So that's really challenging, that's the first solution. The second solution is to replace all of the world's planes with hydrogen aircraft. And that has a real benefit in that it nearly halves the energy you would use, or around halves the energy you'd use. It's a real advantage. But you have to replace the infrastructure and all the planes in the system. And then the final way of doing it is battery electric. And that uses probably a third to a half less energy again. So that has a real advantage. But the problem with that is that batteries are heavy and the range of those aircrafts are limited. And to make the decision between the three routes, you have to think about not only the technology, but you have to think about the infrastructure. You have to think about where your biomass is coming from and the biodiversity. And you have to think about the human behaviour and policy implications. And so you need to think about all of those things together. The jet engine was invented by Frank Whittle, who was a Cambridge student. And he actually founded Power Jets while he was still a student in the university. And many of that original team he worked with were from Cambridge. And in 1972, many of that original team came back to open the Whittle Laboratory. And it was realised at the time that the jet age was upon us. And it was felt that the technologies which would go into the jet engine needed to be developed in the UK and to go into UK industry. And at that moment, the Whittle Lab was formed. And since then, we've worked for 50 years as the Global Research Centre in Aerothermal Technology with Rolls-Royce, the same with Mitsubishi Heavy Industries. We've worked with Siemens for the same period of time. We've worked with Boeing. And all of these companies, on, on any day, you will see members of their design teams in the Whittle Lab, or you'll see us in their design offices. And that link is absolutely critical if you're to get these fundamental technologies into real-world products fast enough to tackle the climate crisis. Three years ago, the King visited the Whittle Laboratory to announce us building the new Whittle Laboratory and the National Centre for Propulsion and Power. And when he visited, he asked whether we could organise a round table to try and think from a sectoral level about the way we decarbonise aviation. And with the King actually chairing the meeting, we got all the top people for who produce the fuels, the airports, the engines, government, everybody was there around the table. And at that event, we discovered that the problem was that everyone talked a different language. There was a complete lack of communication across the sector. And what we started to realise was because the aviation sector has been stable for 50 or 60 years, everybody only knows how to do their bit of it. And at that round table, Cambridge, led by the Whittle Laboratory and Cambridge Institute for Sustainability Leadership, were called on to see if we could unlock change at a sector level. And we started something called the Aviation Impact Accelerator. And that's grown over two or three years. So within Cambridge, we have the BP Institute, we have chemical engineering, we have the main engineering faculty, 
we have the Judge Business School. And then we expanded. MIT joined us, Melbourne University joined us, Rolls-Royce joined us, Boeing joined us, Etihad joined us. And amongst this group, we've been building a model, an aviation-wide model that takes us from an understanding of the resources that are acquired in aviation, the renewable electricity, the water, the land, the money, all the way through the power production, the fuel production, the passenger journey, the flight, the global network, all the way up to the climate model. So this isn't a well-to-wake model, this is a resource to climate model and allows us to play with different choices. And the aim of the model is to find ways to accelerate the path to zero emission flight. The Aviation Impact Accelerator model has had a number of impacts. So the first tool we've developed is like a Google Flights, but you can predict the future. You can choose to do a flight in the future. And it sorts through all the technology options, all the fuel options, all the different routes you can travel. And it tells you the consequence in terms of the resources required and the climate impact. And that tool really has been designed to be used by clever school children, CEOs, CTOs, MPs, ministers, to inform them about the nature of the problem. A second tool, which is already live on the web and, and you can use, allows companies to look at different types of sustainable aviation fuel. There are many types, and some of them will have very little benefit for the climate, and some will have rather large benefits. And so we have a comparison tool, the Climate to Resources Comparison Tool, which you can use today. And that's been used a lot by people like Boeing and Rolls-Royce to compare these different fuel routes. And then we have a third tool, and this tool was, was really interesting. So we were approached by Sarah Sharples, who's the chief scientist of the Department of Transport. And the Department of Transport were trying to develop what are called the Sustainable Aviation Fuel Mandates, the law which um, helps us to grow sustainable aviation fuel in the markets. And they came down and we met and we helped them with their questions. But as part of that, our modelling team started to understand the nature of the policy problem. And so we developed a specific tool which mined the main tool of data and we sent it to them. And there were hundreds of emails back and forth. And in that process, they understood the science better and we understood the policy restrictions better. And we improved the tool and improved the tool. And that tool is now in the government's aviation model and has been used to develop the sustainable aviation mandates, fuel mandates, which will be coming out soon.